All right, see if you can spot the pattern here. Um, within days of the Trump administration starting, the Justice Department was warning the new White House, the new White House counsel specifically, that the, the, there was a serious security issue with the president's new national security advisor. He had been having secret communications with the Russian government, and he had been publicly lying about that. So the acting attorney general, the Justice Department, came to the White House. And, and told the Trump White House that their national security advisor was compromised by the Russian government. It later emerged that national security advisor Mike Flynn had also not declared income that he had received from multiple Russian sources and other foreign sources. He and his business relations ended up being the subject of multiple federal grand jury subpoenas. And Mike Flynn ended up having to retroactively register as the agent of a foreign power. And even... After that, we learned about still further meetings between Flynn and Russian officials during the transition that he had never disclosed. So Mike Flynn turns out not to have been an awesome choice to be the top White House official advising the president of the United States on national security matters. He was allowed to resign in February. But by March, the White House was insisting, honestly, they'd never even really heard of the guy. Has anyone from the White House? Well, can I just you? amend the first? Sure. Obviously, I just with just to be clear, I know that I'm trying to think through this for a second because obviously um, General Flynn. Right. But again, I Gen the right and, the and, and and I'm not aware of any at this time. But even General Flynn was was a volunteer of the campaign. He was a Flykmin. Flykmin. What was it? Mike. Mike. Oh, uh, something. Mike Finn. No. We didn't really think of him as the national security advisor. He was more like a national security coat check boy. You know, he's volunteer. He was a campaign volunteer. He volunteered for like a minute. He like made coffee. So national security advisor Mike Flynn downgraded after the fact to a volunteer for the campaign. Uh, then there was the chairman of the campaign. Seen here with the last boss he's known to have had before he somewhat inexplicably started working for the Trump campaign for free in 2016. Paul Manafort's previous employment before the Trump campaign was working for a pro-Putin political party and a dictator in the nation of Ukraine. Uh, like National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, Paul Manafort also ended up having to retroactively register as the agent of a foreign power. He, too, turned out to have had multiple communications during the campaign with the Russians, even though for months he publicly denied that he had done any such thing. In March, the Associated Press reported that Paul Manafort had signed up for a multi-million dollar annual contract with a Russian billionaire close to Vladimir Putin. The contract said Paul Manafort would promote the interests of Putin's government around the world. The Associated Press published that account in March. The Russian billionaire in question sued the AP over that newspaper article and denied its claims. Earlier this month, the billionaire lost his case in federal court against the AP. And the AP stands by that reporting. Paul Manafort was also later, to, uh, later revealed to have offered private briefings on the campaign to that same Putin-connected Russian oligarch. Manafort made the offer for him to get private briefings um, while he was serving as the campaign chairman and therefore definitely in a position to deliver them. So, I mean, when, when you're chairman of a presidential campaign, that generally means you are chairing the presidential campaign, right? But just as Mike Flynn was dismissed as merely a campaign volunteer, when all this stuff started to come out about Paul Manafort, the White House, true to form, insisted they'd never even really met Paul Manafort. He, yeah, he, maybe he was around for a while, but he was definitely like there and gone in, an, in a minute. I don't even remember what he looks like. And then obviously there's been this discussion of, of Paul Manafort, who played a very limited role for a very limited amount of time. But beyond... But are you the chairman? Hey, John, Jonathan, hold on. Can you, can you stop interrupting other people's questions? Okay, hey, Jonathan, somebody's asking a question. It's not your press briefing. Julie's asking a question. Please calm down. Who needs to calm down? <laughs> the follow-up question there was, he played a limited role for a limited amount of time, but he was the chairman of the campaign. Calm down. So the pattern here is, the pattern here is, I mean, it's, in a way, it's kind of funny, right? I mean, there are a large number of people, a surprisingly large number of people who were involved in the Trump campaign who turn out to have had not just undisclosed, but extensive and bewildering contacts with Russian officials during the campaign or during the transition. 
But the way it goes is, as soon as those things get exposed, the Trump White House insists they never knew that guy. It happened with that guy, Carter Page, um, as well. We heard you might be announcing your foreign policy advisory team soon, if there's anything We are going to be that. doing that, in fact, uh, very soon. I'd say during the week we'll be announcing some, some names. It'll always grow. Any It'll that you can start off with this morning with us? Well, you know, I hadn't thought in terms of doing it. If you want, I could give you some of the names. I, I wouldn't be delighted. I wouldn't mind. Um, do you have that list? I'll be a little more accurate with it. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Take notes. Waleed Ferris, who you probably know, uh, PhD advisor to the Asa Representatives Caucus, and uh, is a counterterrorism expert. Uh, Carter Page, PhD. Carter Page, PhD. That was candidate Trump announcing to the Washington Post editorial board his five foreign policy advisors on his presidential campaign. Now, Carter Page, as well, turns out to have had multiple undisclosed contacts with Russian officials during the campaign. And he also turns out um, to have turned up in an indictment for a Russian spy ring that was being run out of a bank called VEB, the same bank that inexplicably turned out to be meeting with Jared Kushner during the transition in a meeting that Jared Kushner did not publicly disclose. Now, the only reason we ever heard the name Carter Page was because then presidential candidate Donald Trump bragged that a guy named Carter Page, PhD, was one of his five foreign policy advisors for the campaign. But then once we learned about Carter Page and his undisclosed contacts with the Russian government during the campaign, then it's like, oh, Carter Cage? What's his name? Carter who? Why are you saying this name? I've never heard of this person. I think the one person, I don't think I've ever spoken to him. I don't think I've ever met him. And he actually said he was a very low level member of, I think, a committee for a short period of time. I don't think I ever met him. Now, it's possible that I walked into a room and he was sitting there, but I don't think I ever met him. I didn't talk to him ever. See, this is why it's a coveted job to be a foreign policy advisor to a presidential candidate. You will never, ever speak to the candidate, ever. <laughs> so so the, the pattern has been, I mean, on the one level, it's alarming, the way this whole story is. But it has also been kind of funny, in a way. Uh, and today, we got the latest iteration. This just came out. This just came out. WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks. All of these new charges, did you see it just came down today? WikiLeaks, some new stuff, some brutal stuff. The Hillary Clinton documents released today by WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks also shows something I've been warning every, everybody, everybody about for a long time. You know, WikiLeaks just actually came out. John Podesta said some horrible things about you. They got it all down, folks. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. In January, the intelligence community report on the Russian attack on our election described WikiLeaks um, as a, a key element of the Russian operation. Quote, we assess with high confidence that the GRU, Russian military intelligence, relayed material it acquired from the DNC and senior Democratic officials to WikiLeaks. Now, candidate Trump repeatedly expressed during the campaign how much he loved WikiLeaks, how thrilled he was, he was with, the, with the actions taken by WikiLeaks, which we now know were on behalf of Russian military intelligence. Uh, Mike Pompeo, as a Trump-supporting congressman during the campaign, also praised WikiLeaks for its role in what Russia was doing during the campaign. Once Mike Pompeo became CIA director, he noted in his first public comments after being confirmed to run the CIA that WikiLeaks is a, quote, hostile intelligence service, often abetted by Russia. Well, now today, Betsy Woodruff of the Daily Beast reports that the data firm that worked with the Trump campaign during the election to great acclaim, Cambridge Analytica, Cambridge Analytica is run by the billionaire Mercer family who financed so much of the Trump side of the election and the conservative media for the past few years. Cambridge Analytica, in which uh, Steve Bannon has a multi-million dollar stake and which Mike Flynn worked for as well. Cambridge Analytica, which ran data operations for the Trump campaign. Today, Betsy Woodruff at Daily Beast reports that the head of Cambridge Analytica, the group's CEO, quote, wrote in an email last year that he reached out to WikiLeaks about Hillary Clinton during the campaign. According to an email described by two sources familiar with a congressional investigation into this matter, uh, the head of Cambridge Analytica 
reportedly told a third party in this email that he had reached out to Julian Assange from WikiLeaks about uh, his firm, Cambridge Analytica, somehow helping WikiLeaks release Democratic emails. So WikiLeaks was a major part of the Russian operation against the presidential election last year to hurt Hillary Clinton and help elect Donald Trump. WikiLeaks is how they disseminated a large proportion of the documents that were hacked and stolen by Russian government hackers. The, the, those documents very you know, lovingly promoted by candidate Trump himself throughout the campaign. We have previously been able to uh, link WikiLeaks and their behavior on behalf of the Russian government to a, a few different people who are basically associates of Trump and the Trump campaign. People like uh, Roger Stone, for example. But in this case, this new story from the Daily Beast, this is the firm that was doing the Trump campaign's data operations. It's that firm trying to collude with WikiLeaks on hurting Hillary Clinton and helping Donald Trump during the campaign. Like this, Cambridge Analytica doing this thing is different than like some guy Trump hangs out with doing this thing. So what's the reaction from the Trump side of things? By this point, you know what the pattern is. You know it's coming. Uh, the Trump campaign uh, put, uh, put out this statement today after this Cambridge Analytica report came out. Um, Cambr the, the, the Daily Beast report again indicates that Cambridge Analytica was at least trying to collude with a Russian cutout with WikiLeaks to hurt Clinton and help Trump during the campaign. So the Trump campaign to statement today um, in response to this makes clear that Cambridge Analytica, who? You, we have so never heard of them we can't even spell it. This is the statement today from the Trump campaign in response to this Cambridge Analytica news. Quote, we as a campaign made the choice to rely on the voter data of the Republican National Committee to help elect President Donald J. Trump. Any claims that voter data from any other source played a key role in our victory are false. Ambridge Analytica? Did they volunteer for a minute? Bannon, Flynn, Mercer, who? What? We've never, they didn't do anything for us. Cambridge Analytica. As more and more ties are proven between the Russian government and the Russian campaign to affect our election, and all of these different people and entities involved in the Trump for President campaign, it's starting to feel like, you know, one way you can know that something is a very salient story and a provable point they're not going to be able to get away from is when the Trump White House or the Trump campaign starts denying all knowledge of the people and entities involved. Manafort who? Flynn who? Cambridge Anna who? Carter who? What's that? And as these things you know, keep happening, it is harder to dismiss all of them as coincidences. They can't all be random people who walked in off the street that the Trump campaign never noticed. They can't all also just be one-offs that are all disconnected from one another. And maybe these continuing revelations are why the congressional investigations into the Russian attack and the question of whether or not the Trump campaign was involved in it, maybe that's why these investigations this month seem to be going off the rails. Yesterday, we really did see Republicans walk out of their own committee interviews with the digital operations chief for the Trump campaign and the president's personal lawyer to instead announce that they would be launching new investigations into Hillary Clinton. Uh, we've seen multiple reports starting this weekend with the New York Times continuing through this week and multiple other publications that ho however well these various congressional investigations into the Russia issue might have been doing in the past, they're all now basically starting to fall apart. Now, today, Mother Jones was first to report that one of the big investigative committees, the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, has officially blown up. The committee will no longer even attempt to put out a unified report. The Republicans are going to do their own thing, the Democrats are going to do their own thing, and that means there will never be a Judiciary Committee conclusion, a Judiciary Committee report as to what happened, at least not as to their part of the investigation. We're going to be speaking with a member of that committee in just a second to find out if those reports are truly accurate and if it is really as all over as it seems. But there's, there's one last thing that seems important that we keep getting more and more evidence about. Um, and that committee that just reportedly blew up, this is specifically what they were supposed to be looking at. It's the question of obstruction of justice. Whether the president fired FBI Director James Comey or took other actions to divert or suppress or try to influence the criminal and counterintelligence investigations into what happened with Russia. Right? That is what the Judiciary Committee in the Senate has been looking at. Judiciary Committee oversees the Department of Justice, oversees 
the justice system. So that obstruction of justice is right in their wheelhouse. I should tell you, in the House, they never even bothered saying they would investigate that. In the Senate, they did say they were going to investigate that. But now that investigation appears to have imploded. On that issue, though, there is a whole bunch of new public evidence that is all of a sudden getting both more damning and more funny <laughs> at the same time. I'm sorry that I find some of this funny, but some of it is so ridiculous I find it funny. You'll see what I mean in just a second. In May... The New York Times published this photo in this article about an investor's pitch that was being made in China by Jared Kushner's family's real estate company. The Kushners reportedly did a presentation in China in which they appeared to offer green cards to live in the United States um, to any Chinese citizen who would give the Kushner family $500,000 for one of their real estate projects. And, you know, making that pitch is one thing. Making that pitch while bragging and showing pictures to remind everybody in the room that your family is in the White House, that is something else. And that was apparently the subject of a subpoena to the Kushner organization um, by federal prosecutors operating out of the Eastern District of New York. At least one of the Kushner properties where they were apparently trying to sell this cash for green cards deal was in the jurisdiction of the U.S. Attorney's Office in, e in the Eastern District of New York, which, which is headquartered in Brooklyn. So that was the specific U.S. attorney who subpoenaed the Kushner companies over their investment for a visa program, as you see in this story from the Wall Street Journal. It's the Eastern District. Then there's also the Southern District of New York, which is headquartered not in Brooklyn, but in Manhattan. The Wall Street Journal reported this week that Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort is under criminal investigation by that U.S. attorney's office for alleged money laundering. Now, it has also recently been reported that President Trump has met personally with two lawyers who he's considering, who, who's considering nominating to run those two U.S. attorney's offices. This is something no president has ever done before, as far as anybody can tell. Meeting with people who you might appoint to be federal prosecutors in jurisdictions where you and your family are in your campaign or potentially involved in criminal matters that may, become, that may come before that office? I mean, no president is known to have ever done this with potential U.S. attorney nominees before. I asked the former attorney general, Eric Holder, about it right here the other night. This is how he characterized it. Unprecedented. Um, the way it was done in the Obama administration and the Clinton administration as well, and I think in the, the Bush administrations, um, the highest level person that you spoke to as an incoming attorney general, as an incoming U.S. attorney, was in fact the attorney general. That was it. Um, nobody went to talk to the White House. And why is that? Why was that? Um, why was it structured that way? To again ensure that independence, so that a U.S. attorney would understand that your boss is the Attorney General of the United States. You're not supposed to have any contacts. A U.S. attorney is not supposed to have any contacts with the White House except through the, the Justice Department. And the choices that as Lee's has been reported, of the people who he spoke to, I think are interesting. Two U.S. attorneys in New York, the U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., and the U.S. attorney in Florida, who's gotten where Mar-a-Lago is. And that gives me some concern that he has decided to have these interactions with the United States attorneys who might possibly be in a position um, to get at him. And what's the correction? You know, to hopefully uh, have good people in these positions who will, in spite of the fact that they've had this, uh, these meetings with the, um, with the president, will understand what the nature of their jobs um, is. That's the correction? The hope they're good people? Yeah. Yeah. The only corrective we know for this situation in terms of defending the independence of federal prosecutors, defending the independence of the criminal justice system, is to hope that these candidates for U.S. attorney jobs that the president is inappropriately meeting with, we just, we're just supposed to hope that they're good people who are rigorously independent from the president and his interests, despite this fact that he's meeting with them before he considers appointing them. We just have to hope they have no connection to him whatsoever. Well, the potential nominee to run the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York turns out to be a member of Mark Kazowitz's law firm. Mark Kazowitz is one of the president's lawyers on the Russia issue. The potential nominee who the president met with for the Southern District of New York is, is a member of Rudy Giuliani's law firm, the president's campaign supporter and his very good friend. Now, you heard Eric Holder there mention that there may have also been a meeting with the potential U.S. Attorney nominee in South Florida, one who would have jurisdiction over anything that touched on the president's southern estate 
leaked in Mar-a-Lago. We have been trying to chase that down. We've spoken to multiple contacts in Florida to figure out if such a meeting has happened and who that potential nominee might be. That would be a person who, in the Southern District of Florida, they, they would have jurisdiction conceivably over anything related to the president's estate at Mar-a-Lago. Now, our best guess, the best reporting coming out of South Florida right now as to who the contender for that job is in the Trump White House uh, is this man who in this clip is feeling very sad because in this clip he's being fired by Donald Trump during season five of The Apprentice. It's a guy from Kazowitz's law firm for Eastern District, guy from Giuliani's law firm for Southern District, and a guy from The Apprentice from Mar-a-Lago. If the president is stacking key federal prosecutor jobs in jurisdictions where he and his family and his campaign have potential or actual federal criminal liability, this is the kind of thing you'd expect the Senate Judiciary Committee to be all over in terms of whether or not the White House is trying to pervert the federal law enforcement system in this country to meet the president's personal needs. That's the sort of thing the Senate Judiciary Committee might have been looking into until today when apparently that blew up. That's next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.